okay, we're on week two of leadership. And if you remember, we're hitting these principles. And the plan is to go through uh, these nine principles of leadership. And then we're going to actually dig into some of the characters of the Bible and some of the leaders. And not all leaders necessarily qualify as good leaders. But there's some uh, bad leaders that are also very influential too. But let's just go back and do a, a quick recap uh, on what exactly a leader is. I think our world, even in the Christian realm, there's a lot of different um, ideas of what constitutes a leader. So does it mean it's somebody who's got charisma, uh, somebody who uh, tends to uh, have a strong personality, maybe somebody who uh, influences others, which I would lean definitely that route, but would you say leadership is just merely influence? John Maxwell, that's the book that we're going to be reading, The 21 uh, Irrefutable Laws of Leadership, actually would say that's his definition of leadership, but um, we're going to take it just a step further because if a child jumped on top of a bridge and was threatening to jump into traffic and it slowed down traffic to where uh, everybody was being influenced by this child's decision, does that mean that that child is a leader? Well, not necessarily, because we're actually referring to biblical or spiritual leadership. So we could say, yes, leadership is influence, but if you want to get more detailed, we're after moving people onto God's agenda. So that's our definition of leadership. It's actually more than influence. It's moving people onto God's agenda. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, Be ye followers of me as I am of Christ. So there's no doubt about it. He was a leader. He had followers. He moved people onto God's agenda. So that's the definition we're sticking with. That's the biblical definition. And we saw last week that um, whether you're an employer, whether you're a husband, whether you're a parent, a pastor, a discipler, a ministry leader, a Christian in general, that you have the authority to lead. You've been called to lead. So uh, having said that, the first principle we saw last week was it begins with knowing who you are in Christ. To know who you are in Christ, your identity in Him, you've got to start there. And that's one of the biggest areas that the enemy is going to attack us in simply because um, his nickname would be the accuser of the brethren. He accuses day and night. And I'm sure each and every one of us has experienced this aspect where uh, he, he causes us to lose confidence in what he's called us to. And there's been many times in my life where I've even set my face towards the past and I've looked at some of the um, where I've come from, my background, decisions I've made, and I can hear the whispers of the devil just saying, you don't have what it takes. You're nothing but a failure. And then I have to go back and look what the Word of God says. Nope, I'm in Christ, and he's called me to something that's so much bigger than myself. It's not even about me. It's about him now. And that, that, that totally solidifies my confidence. And uh, it helps me to realize that, Lord, you're the one that called me. And if you called me, you're going to pay for it. You're going to take care of it. And so I'm just going to stick with you. So know who you are in Christ. And now that, that's the first principle we see as a leader. But we're going to try to get through these next uh, three. And uh, so let's, let's look at number two. The second principle of leadership. It's know that you're responsible for the people that you lead. Know that you're responsible for the people you lead. It's responsibility. Because if anybody is responsible, it's the leader. And this is something, unfortunately, that needs said over and over again and reminded, but why did the Lord call Adam when Eve's actually the one that sinned first? Well, Adam was the leader. Adam was the one who was responsible. He's the one 
who is to give an account. It's the leader that's going to be held responsible. So as the leader, you and I, we have been given a task or a charge to perform. And what it boils down to is own that. Be responsible for it. There's a quick side note. This isn't in your notes, but 1 Samuel 17, 20. That's a good one to write down. 1 Samuel 17, 20. I really like this. This is right before David finds out that there's a giant antagonizing the camp. And he's just a low, mere shepherd boy. And check out what it says. It's these little side notes that the Holy Spirit puts in the, the Bible to give us the uh, uh, details and the integrity of who we're looking at. It says in verse 20, And David rose up early in the morning, and he left the sheep with a keeper. And he took and he went, as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the trench as the host was going forth to the fight, and he shouted for the battle. Did you catch what he did? He rose up in the morning and he left his sheep with the keeper. He was responsible. David was simply responsible. And some one of the things that as leaders that we need to remind our leaders who are uh, under us, under our watch, is, yeah, be responsible. Own it. We have so many people in our Sunday schools here at the church who I can't tell you how many times They'll have a scheduling conflict or something comes up last minute when they're supposed to be teaching the following Sunday. And I'm amazed that when somebody calls me and says, I can't show up, I had this happen, and they expect me to do something about it. We need to be responsible. At some point, we've got to stop spoon-feeding our people and put it on them and say, then you need to train up somebody and replace yourself. You need to be responsible like David was. Leave the sheep with the keeper and make sure that it's somebody else who loves the Lord, who fears the Lord, who can train these sheep, not just anybody. So the standards are high, and David understood that. Well, we have also been given a charge or a task to perform. So let me just take a quick moment and look at the priests in the Old Testament because it says here in Numbers on your notes, Numbers 3, 7, and 8, that it was the priests that actually had a charge. They had a charge to keep. And don't turn there, just for time's sake, but definitely write this down. They had a charge of the instruments of God. They had a charge of the people of God. And it was obviously the Levitical priests, the, the Levites, and then the priests, those two classes that God uh, set to be in charge of this special privilege. God was their inheritance, as opposed to all the other tribes of Israel. So what we see here is these priests have a special charge. Well, we today as priests have that same charge. We have the same charge of keeping God's word pure and then also keeping God's people pure. And so uh, there's some scripture there, 1 Timothy 3, uh, 14 and 15, and then 620 on uh, on in the New Testament, how, how that applies to us. But it ultimately, uh, as leaders, our duty is to guard, proclaim, and pass on God's words, just as the Levitical priests did in the Old Testament. So that's a charge that's given us. Um, let's go to 1 Timothy 6.20. 1 Timothy 6.20, right there in your notes. Look what he says. And this is written to pastors. It says, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so-called. We're charged, we're commanded to keep, keep these things, which is ultimately the word of God. And uh, if you go back to chapter 3, 14, and 15, these things write unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou oughtest mayest know how thou oughtest behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. Well, what's truth? Thy word. This is truth right here. So as the church, we're the pillar and the ground of truth. And we have a, a great responsibility of uh, keeping God's word pure, which that literally happened uh, with the priesthood in the first century century. 
and there's another class we, we, we do, it's called Manuscript of Evidence, where we get into the details of that. So just as the Old Testament Levitical priests were in charge of preserving God's Old Testament, God used the same system in the New Testament. He used his priests, which are the New Testament believers, uh, to preserve his word to this day. And he's kept his promise. But at the same time, we have the charge of keeping God's people pure. And that's through God's word, through truth. So that's why we never hold back on the word. The word is always preached. We always encourage and we always exhort people, uh, Christians, to get in the word daily. This is always going to be the solution. It's not you or it's not me. It's going to be through, through the book. So look at this next point here. We know we have a responsibility. We're to own it as leaders. But the next blank is the responsibilities of this charge over God's word and God's people are clearly defined in 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 5. The responsibilities... If we look at 2 Timothy chapter 4, a great passage for leaders especially. Notice what he says, I charge therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. So the first thing we need to put down, notice he says, we're to preach the word, not our own convictions. We're not to preach about the word. Preach the word. So, your first blank, the word. Preach the word. How often do we see uh, somebody didn't do their studies, and so, rather than being honest with the book and preaching the word, what it says, they try to preach what they think it says. Or they preach maybe... Uh, whatever is easy for them to preach and try to make the word fit their ideology. But that's not what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to just preach the word. And uh, these other classes we're, we're doing, especially unlocking the Bible as it's coming up, that's going to be a perfect class for uh, breaking down the word to where you're being honest with the text and preaching nothing but the word. But notice what he says next. We're to be instant, in season, out of season. That word instant, in season, out of season, is simply saying that we're to always be ready. We're to be instant even when it's out of season. Even, even when it's not convenient. Even when it's not convenient, we're to always be instant and be ready. Be ready to preach, be ready to reprove, exhort. And that's the next one is reprove. Reprove. In Proverbs chapter 9, verse 8, great verse. Proverbs 9.8 says this. Reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love thee. So we see that reproving and rebuking are very closely related. And that's right here in chapter 9, verse 8. Uh, but notice, a wise man is actually going to appreciate the fact that uh, you would reprove him. So remember that verse the next time you have to say hard words. To a dear brother in Christ, and um, he knows that you don't want to say those words. But if you're going to be biblical and speak the truth in love, like we're commanded to do, uh, he's going to thank you one day. I can't tell you how many times I've been thankful for dear brothers in my life that were bold enough uh, to rebuke me when I needed it and to reprove me. So what is reproof? Well, reproof begins with simply telling a fault. To tell a fault or uh, allow the Holy Spirit to do the convicting. That's where reproving starts. So you can't always just have the positive. You've got to start with the negative. And that's, that's a part of leadership as well. The negative is so necessary. And then that takes us to the next point, is rebuking. To rebuke would simply, like I said, it's very close to reproof. But you could go with rebuke as to forbid or to admonish. So not only are you telling a fault, now you're simply saying, and that's not acceptable. I forbid you. You cannot continue to live that way. If you're going to be in this position, if you're going to be, if you think that you're going to be a leader, if you want to be um, a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, you've got to end that. 
So very hard words. It's very difficult. And this is the aspect of leadership uh, that's, that's not always easy. In fact, we're going to see in a moment, it, it can be pretty lonely. Some of the loneliest people on earth are some of God's leaders. So to reprove and to rebuke. And then, here's the good part. You don't always have to stay negative. In fact, when you break somebody down, if you leave them that way, there's a problem. It's time to pull them back up, and that's the next word is exhort. He says to exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. So once you break them down or allow God to break them down, you get to be the instrument to pull them back up. So to exhort would simply be to put down in the blank here, to build back up. You can even put the word encourage next to it. To encourage. It's so necessary. With all long-suffering. Long-suffering, I call that patience on steroids. Jesus was so long-suffering with us. God is long-suffering towards humanity all the time. So, if he's like that towards us, why can we not be like that towards our sheep? They need it. And then notice what he says next. A great list for leaders here. He says, preach the word, reprove, rebuke, exhort. And then verse 3, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. Sounds like today. Verse 5, But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, and make full proof of thy ministry. So the next one I want to look at is that. He says, we're to watch in all things. To watch in all things. There's a great cross-reference you can put here. It's Deuteronomy 22.1. That's the passage that talks about if you see your brother's ox going astray, then you'd better not hide yourself from that. It's your responsibility to do something about it. It's your responsibility to say something. Own it. So as a leader, if you're truly called by the Lord, and you have this responsibility, and you see something like that happen, and you don't say a word about it, I'm not sure you're a leader. There's going to be a conviction of responsibility take place you're responsible in saying something. I like that example. Uh, so you can put down in your blank here uh, the word vigilant. You're always watching. And you know, I mentioned earlier, this is part of the aspect of leadership people don't like. It's more than just telling people what to do. Or being a pastor, we know this, that it's more than just preaching on Sunday mornings. It's more than just getting to teach behind the pulpit. It's so much more. You're dealing with people. And this is the part where you're protecting. We're going to get into a heavy passage in a moment on that, protecting the sheep. But to be vigilant is to be watchful, to be observant. Somebody who's not observant is probably not going to be a very good leader. I've had to learn over the years to become more observant. And some people are naturally wired that way. Uh, they just don't quite pay attention. And so for me personally, the Lord's had to really open my eyes on some things, and I have to work a little harder at observing some of the details, too. But that, that makes a big difference, and people can tell. So, um, to be observant, to be sober, uh, to be your eyes always open, that's what it means to watch in all things. And then uh, he says in point G here, to endure afflictions, and I think that's really the, the point Paul's making in this, this entire little letter to Timothy. This is one of his letters right before he dies. And he says, Timothy, man, if anything, endure. I've endured, look at my life. I've made it, I'm just, I'm encouraging you, I'm exhorting you to do the same thing. It's not going to be easy. Just stand strong and endure. Um, he says in point H, do the work of an evangelist. In other words, continually recruit. Don't stop there. You know, some pastors and leaders make that really all what they're about. But that's really just one in this whole list. You know, evangelism is vital. I mean, that's one of our key roles. But we're not going to be very good evangelists if we're not doing these other things. If we're not making disciples and training up leaders, if we're not multiplying, we won't be very effective. 
and evangelism. But let's make sure that we're also doing the work of an evangelist. Anywhere and everywhere we go, uh, we are preaching Christ. So that's, that's, a, that's a vital for us. And then he says in point I, make full proof of your ministry. In other words, persuade others that you are the real deal. You're leaving nothing undone. So make full proof of your ministry. So these are the responsibilities that uh, Paul gave to Timothy. And now let's flip over to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. There's three primary goals. Three primary goals that we have to accomplish with God's people. This is another key passage for shepherds. If you're shepherding God's people as a pastor, as a, a small group leader, then this right here is where it begins. Number one, if you look at verse two, it says, Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. So number one would simply be this, feed. You've got to start out by feeding. Feeding the flock, that starts out as the initial role. Our initial goal is to feed the flock. If they're not getting fed, we're failing. Of course, like we mentioned earlier, we don't feed them our own convictions. We don't feed them uh, books of what other people have written. We feed them the word. This right here is the living bread, the bread of life. So this is what's going to nourish. And so it's our responsibility to feed them. You remember that passage? It's the feeding of the 5,000. That happens to be in all four Gospels. It's the only miracle that all four Gospels list. And uh, what's interesting about that is that They've been with him, I believe it says, for a couple of days, this multitude. So they're getting weak and weary. And while the disciples wanted to send them away, Jesus wanted to feed them. We can learn some major lessons from that. You see, while disciples wanted to send them home so that they could go get their food, and they didn't know that Jesus was going to do a miracle, but their mentality was, send the people away. And Jesus says, no. Give them to eat. And that's the approach he wants us to have. We can learn a lot of lessons from that. And it, it, it's, it's about feeding the flock. Feeding the flock. A great verse that we teach our Sunday school teachers here. Acts 20, 28. This is what Paul tells the leaders of Ephesus. He'd given his farewell speech to a bunch of shepherds, to a bunch of leaders. Check out what he says here, verse 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock, over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God which he hath made, uh, or which he hath purchased with his own blood. So, what's the primary goal of a shepherd? Well, most people think when they read this verse, what's to feed the flock? Yeah, but what, what's before that? Notice what he says at the beginning of the verse. Take heed therefore unto yourselves first. So put down in your blank here that feeding the flock actually begins with your walk with the Lord. It's got to begin there. Because if your walk is out of balance, if your walk is in bad shape, you've really got no business trying to nourish these sheep. Now, don't get me wrong. As leaders, even, we go through some dry times. We'll go through some, um, some hardship. There'll be a day or so here and there where uh, we might be in a spiritual funk. I I'm not talking about that. I have teachers in our Sunday school buildings who, um, they might have been out of the Word for a few days, but they know they need to get back to where their fellowship with the Lord is sweet and get back out of that dry season. And, and here, here's what it boils down to is a hard attitude. If a leader is consistently in that spot where they're not healthy spiritually and their walk with the Lord is put on the back burner and they're doing nothing about it, we have a major problem. They are not in a position where they can expect growth from their sheep if they're not growing. 
So this is what we're talking about here. It begins with your walk with the Lord. If you're not feeding yourself, how are you going to feed the flock? So never stop growing. Don't make your your personal readings only about um, giving to other people. Make sure it's ultimately about the Lord. Make sure you're growing closer to Him. And as leaders, those personal quiet times we have are, are, are going to be the key. We've got to be close to Jesus through this. We've got to be men and, and women of prayer and the Word. So it begins with your walk. Take heed to yourself. Some of my best stuff that I use to teach, whether I'm teaching children or grown-ups, it's usually from, from my personal time with Jesus. It's the inspirational that sticks to me. So um, make sure that you're still walking with the Lord. And that's just vital. We can't emphasize that enough. But notice in verse 27 here, look at the verse right before that. Paul's talking to the same group of leaders. He says, For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. You see, feeding the flock, it involves declaring the full counsel of God, not just the warm and the fuzzy passages, not just the feel-good passages, not just the passages that we like. It's all the counsel of God, even the ones where you have to be honest and say, guys, I'm not quite sure what that means. I'm, uh, I'm going to do my best and study it out more. And there's times you might just have to say, your guess is as good as mine. Maybe I'm not ready to learn what that means yet, and that's okay. So the bottom line is you put your work in, uh, search the scriptures, rightly divide it, and then uh, God's going to allow you to be able to feed and nourish the sheep through that. So it begins with feeding the flock, but there's so much more to it. And I say so much more to it. A lot of, a lot of leaders, a lot of shepherds are really failing here. We know of many churches where their congregation is starving. They're not getting fed. Very malnourished. And let that not be said of us. Number two. Number two is to oversee. We're to oversee the flock. And so once again, we see that leadership is so much more than just getting to feed. That's the fun part many times. But to oversee, this is the responsibility part that we just talked about in that last point. To be responsible. If you look back at verse uh, 29, here in Acts 20, Paul says to these same group of, left, of uh, shepherds, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Then he says, Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. He says, Guys, I know the enemy's going to show up. You need to be aware of that. He's going to show up in two ways. He says in verse 29, As a, a grievous wolf... In other words, the enemy shows up from the outside as a roaring lion or a wolf, and everybody pretty much knows, wow, that's the devil. And if he can't get you that way, then he says he's going to show up from the inside as an angel of light. So be aware of that. Oversee. Be vigilant. Like Paul told Timothy, leaders are overseers knowing that the flock will be attacked. And so that's why it says in Hebrews 13, 17 on your sheet there that we watch for their souls. We're overseers who watch for their souls. It's a big responsibility. It's part of protecting the body. So a shepherd that doesn't protect his sheep, that's a bad shepherd. We protect our sheep from attack. Of course, we know as believers... It's a spiritual warfare that we're in as well. So not only from physical attack and the physical things that can tend to harm, it's primarily the spiritual. Because we've got to be careful. We'll get in a second on how we're commanded not to lord the flock. We can't tell uh, people what to do when it comes to uh, making personal decisions. And this is a hard line to draw many times, but... Uh, we can't lord the flock. He's the lord of that. He's the chief shepherd. But we have a major responsibility to watch over their soul and to, um, to spiritually nourish them and oversee them. We'll get to that here in a second. But we're to oversee willingly. And that's your blank. Willingly. 
not for reward. It's good every now and then to ask yourself, I have to do this myself, is what's best for the church? Not what's best for me. Not even what's best for me and my family. And I'm not saying that's always a bad question to ask, but as a leader, it's the shepherd, the, the, the principle of I've got these sheep I'm responsible for. What's best for the sheep for the moment? And many times it's going to require a sacrifice. It's going to require a willing heart. Because if you're always seeking after a reward, I'm not convinced you're going to make it. It's got to be an unconditional so overseeing the flock, that's part of that great responsibility. And then I go back to 1 Peter 5. There's a third goal here that we have. First Peter chapter 5. Look at verse 3. He says, And neither is being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. So, we're to be an example. And that word, number three here, example, simply means it's like an example, but notice the word sample. A sample is a pattern. It's a pattern. It's like a sample from the inside out. It's, it's the real deal. That's what we're supposed to be. We're to be an example. Well, that begins by not lording over them. If we're just going to be a dictator and tell people what to do, which... I've seen pastors operate that way. It never ends good for them. Uh, but if that's what somebody thinks, and, and honestly, the Catholic Church, they tend to operate that way as well. They've operated that way for the last 2,000 years, and it's, it's not ending well for them, as we can see on the news even today. And the Bible declares uh, it's going to really hit them hard in Revelation 17 and 18. But we don't lord over them because Christ is the master, not us. Our example is simply in teaching them. So put down in your blank that your example is by far the greatest teacher. I can say that with confidence because it wasn't books that I've read. It wasn't even um, a lot of the Bible schooling and the classes that I took that was my greatest teacher. I would say by far my greatest teacher was the men God put in my life what I could follow as they followed Christ. Discipleship. God put key men in my life, and there's different levels of that discipleship, but that, by far, has been my greatest teacher. It's the 1 Corinthians 11 one principle. So as you're an example or an example to your flock, I'm telling you, that's going to be the greatest teacher they have. If you're not being an example, if you're teaching one thing and then living another way, don't plan on making a difference in the lives of your flock. It's that simple. Titus 2.7 says, In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. In all things. Not just during the good times, not just during the easy moments. They're going to be watching you, especially during the dark times. So in all things, in all areas, be that example or that pattern. And Paul, of course, we're back in the Acts chapter 20, As he's talking to his leaders, he says in verse 26, Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. So Paul, he wasn't being arrogant. He was simply saying this, guys, I'm, I'm an example to you. Have you looked at my life? Paul's life was like public property. He had nothing to hide. And he says, if anything... Look to me, every person I've come across, I've proclaimed Christ. My conscience is clean. I'm pure from the blood of all men. So he was a prime example. And Paul, not only was he an example, uh, he was a servant. So that takes us to our third principle on leadership. The second principle is know that you are responsible for the people you lead. Responsibility. And a lot of people, man, they want, they want the title. They want the position, they don't want the responsibility. Well, leadership is responsibility. So, number three, learn to become a true servant because servanthood is an essential quality of leadership. Let me erase this. 
Learn to become a servant because servanthood is an essentially quality of leadership. There should be a box on the bottom of your paper. Skip down a few lines. The rectangle, it says this in the rectangle. Not every servant is a true leader, but every true leader is a servant. Okay? So just because somebody is a servant doesn't necessarily qualify them as a leader. However, one of the key attributes you're going to find in every good leader is the fact that they're a servant. What does a servant mean? Obviously, um, you tell your child to do something or... Uh, Somebody in the ministry is working with you, and they, they do what you say. Does that make them a servant? Well, let's look at what a servant is. Paul, if anybody, Paul was a servant. What I always thought was interesting is that if there is he liked the most. I mean, here's the Apostle Paul. You could call him a rabbi, a teacher, a preacher, an apostle. This guy had some apostolic authority that everybody would look up to. He never used those titles as near as much as he used the title servant. He was a servant to God Almighty, a minister. So he understood this. So here's what a true servant is. Look at point A. True servanthood involves having the heart of a servant. Heart. That's true humility. 1 Peter 5, 5 and 6. We were just there in the first few verses, but... Uh, don't turn there for time's sake, but if you just note that, that involves sacrifice. It's a what's best for the team mentality. What's best for the church. Jesus even said it in Matthew 20, 28, when the Son of Man came not to minister, uh, or not to be ministered to, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. So it, it, it's so much better to humble yourself than to be humbled. And uh, leaders, they develop character when their power is restrained. That's servanthood. That's servanthood. So true servant involves having the heart of a servant. And that's the humility. Now here's a practical factor on servanthood. Look at point B here. This is interesting because in reality, note this, it's the servant who actually has the power. You ever think of it that way? If a servant won't follow... Well, then the leader is powerless to accomplish the work. Notice Paul, even, was always the one who addressed the person first who was in submission because they were the ones who had the ability to affect the change. Uh, you'll see this little list here. He addressed wives in submission first, then husbands, children in submission first, then the parents, the servants in submission first, then the master. And Jesus actually illustrates this point. I think we do need to look at John chapter 13. This is one of the greatest servant leadership passages in the scriptures. Notice what it says here, though. In John chapter 13, if you look at verse 2, pick it up in verse 3. It says, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God and went to God, he riseth from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and he girded himself. I thought that was interesting that verse 3 points out that knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, knowing clearly who he was, his position, man, that it all belongs to him as the creator, the king of kings, the lord of lords, he humbles himself and he laid aside his garments and he took a towel and began to wash their feet. That's interesting. That reminds me of back whenever... Uh, David, it said in 1 Samuel chapter 16, 9, David was anointed as the king. Nobody knew about it but him and Samuel and his family. But the king, the public, nobody else knew about this. And so here's David. Think about what he was feeling. Then the nervousness, the anxious, the excitement, the unknown of just knowing that God's priest just anointed me to be the king of Israel, knowing that there's a Messiah coming as well, a promise. And yet, uh, David, 
said in 1 Samuel 16, 19, great note to write down that um, he was dwelling with the sheep. He went right back to dwelling with the sheep. He was in the sheep coat where the sheep stay. I thought that was neat. Even after being anointed as king, where was he? With the sheep. Why? Because he was he had the heart of a servant. True shepherds have the heart of a servant. And we see here with Jesus, uh, look at the impact he made. I think at verse 13 here. Yeah, he says, you call me master and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. So one of the lessons we learn here is that a servant has more power to motivate hearts than a Lord does. A servant has more power to motivate hearts than a Lord does. I always thought it was interesting, too, that what was happening to these disciples, they were getting clean. Here's Jesus cleaning these disciples' feet. As they were getting clean, Jesus was getting dirty. The master was actually getting dirty while they were getting clean. The great principle of leadership. There's times where, oh yeah, you're going to have to get sticky, dirty, smelly at times. That's part of the package. Remember how we got the four Gospels? We've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In Matthew, Christ is portrayed as what? The king. He's the king of kings. In Luke, Christ is the son of man. And then in John, you've got him listed as the son of God. And each gospel represents those. So you can even see the, the, the faces of the cherubim, one for each gospel. But you got Mark. In Mark's gospel, you got the face of the ox, the worker, the servant. So we see Jesus. He's as the servant. He was the suffering servant. So put down in your blank here that in Mark's gospel... Jesus was seen as the servant. By far, he's obviously our greatest example as we look on what being a servant is. So not every servant is a true leader, but every true leader is a servant. So that's the second principle. And throughout this semester, we're going to obviously go back to that and see how that's really one of the most essential qualities so know that you're responsible. Be, be responsible. Own it. Two, be that servant. Have a heart of a servant. And then let's, let's hit this last point. And that's number four. You get it on the board here. Stand for the truth and for God, even when standing alone. Stand for the truth. God, even when standing alone. And we all know that there will be times where it's required that you're going to stand alone. Paul had to say that at the end of his life. Nobody else stood with me. And the Lord obviously understands that too. So, spiritual leaders are the ones who stand in the gap. There is a gap, a great breach, and that uh, gap, that breach is caused by sin. And Ezekiel 13.5 on your sheet there, that's where God is saying, man, it's just one man would stand in the gap. I'm looking for one man. He's going to have to stand alone. But man, would somebody just stand up and represent? Why do they do that? What constitutes the leaders who are willing to actually stand in the gap? who stand for the truth, especially when nobody else is doing it. Well, here's why. It's because the Word is their foundation. When the Word of God is our foundation, and we're biblical, then we stick with what the Word says, not with what the people say. So as a pastor, our primary responsibility is not to please the people, it's to please the Lord. And there's going to be times where that's going to go against the ways of the people. And we've got to be okay with that. We're to stand for the truth. We're to stand for our Lord. Uh, go to Psalms 106. 
Psalms 106. Notice that this always involves something crazy taking place. Um, like pick it up in verse 22. It says he's re recalling back sometimes with Israel what God did. Wondrous works in the land of Ham and terrible things by the Red Sea. Therefore, he said that he would destroy them had not Moses, his chosen, stood before him in the breach to turn away his wrath, lest he should destroy them. And so when Israel rebelled and they made the molten calf, Moses was the one who once again was the intercessor. He stood in that gap uh, and made a major difference. But if you look down at verse 30, it says, Then stood up Phineas and executed judgment, and so the plague was stayed, and that was counted unto him for righteousness, unto all generations forevermore. This is interesting because... Um, we're referring now to Phineas. I don't know if you recall the story, I believe it was in Numbers, where there was an Israelitish man and a Midianite woman uh, that were together, which was against God's law. And so a plague was happening as a result. God was bringing judgment upon the camp. What did Phineas do? He immediately killed him. He said he thrust them, the knife right in them. And while it was a horrific act, somebody had to do it. He didn't want to do it, but he obeyed. He was the only one willing to stand in that breach. thought that was interesting. A horrific act that even seems irrational. So uh, Noah building a boat, a horrific act towards society. They looked at him as just the devil. Like, Who are you? They said that he brought condemnation upon the world. And simply because he was obeying the Lord. He was standing in the gap. Jesus' is death on the cross, horrific act. He stood in the gap. He stood in the breach. So these are all examples that you can put down from Moses, Phineas, Noah, Jesus. I mean, you can go on and on. The bottom line is this. There will be times that you're going to have to stand alone. Joshua make that plain and clear to the men in the household. He says, guys, there's going to be times where in your home, you just have to make a declaration and say, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. He says that in Joshua 24, 15. And he says, by the way, there will be times that it seems evil. Yeah, you're going to have people looking at you, questioning you. They'll be questioning your leadership. The devil will even be working through people. Remember how we talked earlier, he's the accuser of the brethren? He'll even be throwing fiery darts at you, getting you to question your decisions and lose that confidence in who you are. Stay biblical, stay the course, and simply, um, even if you're standing alone, but stick with the Word, even when it seems evil. There might be times where you have to refuse going to a wedding because it's not biblical. I've had to, I'm just brought that up because I've had to do that personally in my life. And... We were looked down upon as if we were uh, evil for making some of these decisions, but I couldn't support what was going on there, so we didn't go. There's times where you uh, you might have to shut down a relationship, stop letting people suck your time, and it might seem evil. Well, how could he how could he treat me that way? Oh, because I'd be enabling you to live worldly if I didn't. So it doesn't matter sometimes what the people think. What matters is what God thinks. So even if you have to stand alone, then uh, you take that stand, stand for the truth and for God. So spiritual leaders stand in the gap in this last point, point B, that we're going to see here, is that spiritual leaders stand on principles, not circumstances. Principles, not circumstances. See, circumstances, they're kind of like feelings. They change all the time. They go up, they go down. And too many times, leaders, everybody, but leaders too, they're, they're caught living under the circumstances. We shouldn't be living under the circumstances. We should be living under the umbrella of the Word of God. So uh, the circumstances, if we're allowing those to dictate what we stand upon, 
major no-no. There's no solid foundation there. So God, he says, this is the last verse I'd like to look at in 2 Chronicles 16.9. Great verse for leaders. Great one to put to memory as well. Look what it says here in 2 Chronicles 16.9. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Herein thou hast done foolishly, uh, therefore from henceforth thou shalt have wars. Notice he says, God's after somebody whose heart is perfect towards him. That's a heart. doesn't mean they're sinless. We all sin. We all have this old sin nature. We know that. But to have a perfect heart, it's a heart that's mature and complete. A heart that it's not going to fall astray during the hard times, when the dark times come. Uh, a heart that's fixed on the Lord, like Job said. Oh yeah, even though I'm going through it, naked came I out of the womb, naked shall I return. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. That's a perfect heart to say he had. But God is always looking for someone whose heart won't compromise, nor turn aside from following that which is right. God's looking at our hearts. Let me just look at these three examples as we end here. And these examples are reminders that it doesn't matter what circumstances we go through, we can still make a tremendous impact on others. We can still lead with authority, and our leadership can impact generations later. And th these examples, just three of numerous in the scriptures are many. So first one, Joseph. Joseph. Notice that Joseph was faithful. He was faithful to the Lord in the worst of circumstances. The worst. I mean, think about what he went through. If anybody went through some hardship, we know that Joseph was a beautiful type or a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, but to, to see uh, the suffering when he was innocent, and not just from his brothers, but once he got sold into slavery, uh, he, he went to prison, and uh, he got deceived, he was thrown back into prison after he got elevated into a position of authority. And as he was in prison, uh, he stayed faithful. The Bible says he stayed faithful to the Lord. But he, he spent even another two years after uh, he thought he was going to get out. And just to put yourself in his circumstances, most people would buckle under the pressure. But he was faithful, therefore he had a major impact. In fact, it was actually the butler who, after Joseph interpreted his dream, he forgot all about Joseph. But had Joseph not been faithful and given the Lord all the credit for interpreting that dream, uh, I guarantee later on down the road, the butler would have never remembered Joseph. He wouldn't have brought uh, Joseph to Pharaoh's attention. So because Joseph was always faithful in the worst of circumstances, uh, he, he made a tremendous influence. And so I think that's something to keep in mind. It's not about the circumstances. It's about the Lord, because he's always faithful to us. Um, another one, I love this one, it's in Daniel. Remember that phrase, as he did aforetime? This was back in Daniel chapter 6, when uh, the king, he built this 90-foot tall statue, and there was an edict made that everybody at certain times of day, has to bow down to this statue. Nobody's allowed to pray or bow down to their God. So it says that Daniel, he prayed three times a day daily, opened his windows so that everybody could see. And he could have chosen in his heart to do it differently. He could have said, you know what, I'm going to privately pray. I don't want to offend anybody. I don't want to get in trouble. I don't want to ruffle any feathers. So it doesn't say that. It says, as he did a four time, he opened his windows. He didn't care what people thought. He knew he'd be breaking the law, and he still prayed to his God. Circumstances didn't change anything. His circumstances, actually, if anything, they, they demanded that he'd get cast into that den of lions. But they didn't override his faithfulness. Daniel was a good leader because of that. So Joseph, impactful leader, because he didn't let his circumstances dictate. Daniel, same thing. Third one we'll look at, we're done. Paul. Think about the Apostle Paul's ministry. Think about, even in his epistles, as he's writing his letters, you know, 
Almost half of his epistles were written from prison. You had to think about prison even back then, the difference between prison then and now, and what Paul went through as he was writing these letters during the, the darkness and the, the circumstances, he still carried on his ministry. And that's what I would put down as he carried his ministry amidst the circumstances because they were irrelevant. There would be times, like at the end of Ephesians, where he says, hey, send Tychicus right over there to, uh, to Galatia and to Ephesus. And, we'll, and he's carrying it on as if he wasn't even locked up. He had so much joy and fulfillment because Paul was a good leader. He didn't allow his circumstances to dictate his life. His relationship with the Lord wasn't based on a position, a title, or circumstances. So we stand for the truth of God, and it's based on principles, not circumstances. The principles of this book right here. So that's the fourth principle. Stand for the truth and for God, hey, even if it means standing alone. There's going to be times where we're going to have to do that. And uh, we know that ultimately Jesus, the greatest leader that ever walked this planet, is with us. And not only with us, he's in us. So remember that the next time you have to take a stand and you're alone on that one. So we're going to end it there. My plan is for next time to try to see if we can wrap up these principles. And then we're going to actually get into some character studies in the Bible uh, before we read the book that uh, we're going to look at for leadership. So that's it for today.